what I've really discovered is where people fail, it's around consistency. It's around putting those, putting that information into practice on a day-to-day basis. Um, and this is sort of like the diet industry's dirty little secret because it's, it's not about uh, a strict regime to uh, maintain um, uh, uh, calories. It's not about a particular macronutrient combination, one that is lower in carb or, or higher in fat or higher in protein. Um, it's not about uh, restricting all meat to, to zero. You know, all these are different strategies, um, but, but what it comes down to is consistency. Doctor's Kitchen, recipes, health, lifestyle. Hey, it's Ruby. I'm taking over my own podcast this week. Uh, I have a few things I want to talk about. I generally don't do these solo episodes um, I've done in the past where I talk about health goals like mental well-being, brain health, inflammation, etc. Uh, and the science behind those. I do enjoy those, but I also enjoy the interviewing process. But I think this year, I mean, I'll talk about it when I do a bit of reflections on on the app in general but I think this year I do want to do a few more solo episodes where I can really break down um, some concepts and give you some clear takeaways as well I did an episode recently with a good colleague of mine on thyroid health and uh, during that episode I, I you know I was trying to break down all these quite difficult concepts for you the listener hopefully that will be really useful when it comes out and during that episode I really thought this would really be a cool thing to do in a, in a shortened uh, episode. So more like 30 to 40 minutes where I break everything down just myself, give you some infographics that we can support the podcast with via the newsletter um, and allow me personally to dive into particular topics and explain those in as clear as detail as possible uh, without too much jargon and, and too much meandering because I, I'm a I'm a chatterbox I love to chat to my guests about lots of random stuff and sometimes that can be quite uh, derailing for the listener anyway um, so yeah that's the that the podcast stuff I want to talk about the new book Dr. Rupi Cooks why this is a slightly different direction in that it's a bona fide cookbook it's fully photographed all 100 plus recipes have got images it's something that we haven't done on previous cookbooks before uh, I want to talk about some of the, the key learnings from the book and why I double down on the recipe side of things. Um, I want to read an extract from uh, the introduction of the book as well because I think that's pretty poignant as to why. It, it gives a good reason as to why I chose to really focus on the healthy, easy, flavorful recipe route. Uh, rather than too much on the nutritional medicine side, which uh, I believe I can explore a lot more fully through the podcast and, and having conversations. Um, I also want to give an update on the app, uh, the direction of travel, what I'm struggling with, where we're succeeding. And uh, I want to talk a bit about the studio as well, that we're going to be um, uh, building a purpose kitchen in, a, a fit for purpose kitchen that's going to be for the Doctor's Kitchen cooking show that's going to be on YouTube. Um, I've tried uh, unsuccessfully to to get a, a proper show on TV. I mean, there's the cooking in the Doctor's Kitchen, thrifty cooking in the Doctor's Kitchen that you can find on BBC iPlayer. Um, but a sort of regular cooking show where I show you, the viewer and listener in this case, if you're listening on the podcast, um, literally how to cook using basic ingredients, how to conjure up healthy recipes, what the kind of principles you should be employing when you do create your own recipes, um, and how to have fun with it as well. Uh, so, so hopefully this episode will give you sort of like an overarching uh, a view of, of like what's going on in my mind and, and where Doctor's Kitchen, what the exciting sort of developments are going to be uh, with Doctor's Kitchen and hopefully how you know, that will further help you and support you in your own health journeys. Um, and I do want to round off with uh, what I'm focusing on in 23 and a particular theory or um, philosophical concept that I'm, I'm personally obsessed with. I've talked about it in the podcast before. It's mimetic theory. It's a theory of human behavior um, and culture that suggests 
human beings are, are, are learning machines and we learn and mimic from uh, each other. Um, and that's been critical for our, our survival. But I, I want to talk a, a bit about that and where the the benefits are, the downsides are, and how I'm navigating the propensity to always feel that you need to mimic other people. Um, it kind of plays into why people feel FOMO or feel jealousy or envy, particularly if they're heavy social media users, which uh, although I try and steer clear of, you know, as part of my job, part of it is going to be on social media. So anyway, we'll talk a bit about that in a second. So let me talk first of all about my latest cookbook, Dr. Rupi Cooks. I'm super excited about it. It's out on the 19th of January. It's available in all good bookstores, online, all that good stuff. You can pre-order it now. It's coming out, I think, the day after this episode goes out. Um, so you'll be able to find it in bookstores, support your local independent bookstore if you can, um, or pre-order it online. Uh, there's the bookshop, there's Amazon, all that good stuff. Um, why is this different? Well, everything is geared towards healthy, easy flavor. That is the tagline of, of the book. And I've really streamlined the content and focused on recipes because I feel that's actually where people struggle most. It's not the nutrition information. It's not the, the science or the, you know, the deep dive into the mechanisms as to why this particular ingredient might have these uh, benefits or why this impacts the gut. That's all really, really interesting stuff. I love talking about that. I've done it in previous books, like the first Doctor's Kitchen book. I've done it in Eat to Be Illness, which is where I deep dived into individual elements and individual um, uh, silos of, of the body like the, the brain the heart mental well-being and I've broken down exactly what studies support food and nutrition as medicine um, and the other lifestyle factors as well but really after you know chatting to thousands of people in in, in clinic and patients and, and also colleagues as well what I've really discovered is where people fail it's around consistency it's around putting those putting that information into practice on a day-to-day -day basis um, and this is sort of like the diet industry's dirty little secret because it's it's not about uh, a strict regime to uh, maintain um, uh, calories it's not about a particular macronutrient combination one that is lowering carb or, or higher in fat or higher in protein um, it's not about uh, restricting all meat to, to zero you know all these are different strategies um, but but what it comes down to is consistency and there are plenty of studies that demonstrate that if you consistently eat a certain way that in general removes the crap and focuses on plants, diversity, uh, and lots of colorful foods, you, you're gonna be supporting your brain, your mental well-being, your uh, hormone levels, your um, uh, cholesterol ratio. It, it, it all sort of makes sense because when you provide your body with the right fuel, it knows innately how to, how to look after itself. And interestingly, I mean, that was the, the final chapter in my Eat to Be Illness book. Uh, if you if you read that if you if you got that book um, and you read all the different chapters, I deep dive into and I zoom into all those different uh, areas of the body. And in the final chapter, I invite you, the reader, to look through all the chapters at the summaries and realize that it's all the same thing. It's all about eating whole, eating plenty of fiber, plenty of of colorful, uh, diverse ingredients, largely plants. Um, and, uh, and, and unprocessing your, your diet um, and, and quality fats, obviously. You know, it's, it's a simple formula. The science is, I always say this, the science is complex. The solutions are simple. The implementation is hard. I was gonna say that again. The science, all the stuff that I talk about with the microbiota, uh, inflammation pathways, um, how uh, the brain signals to the gut, you know, and vice versa, the skin, all that kind of stuff. Super, super interesting, super, super complex. Solutions, unprocess your diet, 
increase your vegetable content, maintain uh, a, a whole uh, colorful and diverse um, collection of foods in your weekly uh, shop and, and eat that. Great, S simple solution, right? Implementation, it's hard. The reason why it's hard, well, there's time barriers, there's cost barriers, there's culinary ingenuity barriers. You know, what do I do with this half a radicchio and red pepper? Um, there's uh, obviously um, the accessibility of certain uh, ingredients, particularly when you're in a poor food environment. And so if you know you are from uh, a structure of society that is in a lower economic area, you're going to struggle to find uh, places where you can eat cheaply and uh, well. Um, you're also going to struggle when it comes to all the other factors as well. If you don't have the luxury of time, and it is a real privilege to have the time to cook, you're going to struggle as well. So the, the implementation bit is hard, which is why you know this book is really dialing into healthy, easy, flavorful moves, uh, meals. What are the meals and the, the strategies of creating easy meals that you can do midweek when you're super tired um when you know you you're you're cooking for a family of four uh, and that's why most of the recipes are one pan minimizes the washing up ma mainly things like tray bakes casserole stews curries um most of the recipes you can batch cook uh, a lot of them are freezable a general i always get asked whether um a particular recipe is freezable or not a good general rule of thumb is if it's in a sauce, if it doesn't have a texture that is necessary for the um, for the for the meal, so like uh, there isn't like a crispy texture, there isn't uh, like a nut or anything like that on the top, there isn't like a gratin which has like a a particular lovely uh, crunch to it. It's probably going to be freezable. Obviously, barring things like salads and the like, it's most likely going to be freezable if it's in a in a stew. So a general rule of thumb is that. If it's a stew, casserole, curry, it's freezable. Uh, if it's a salad or anything that has any element of crunch in it, probably not going to taste great when it's reheated um, and everything else in between. And whole whole ingredients like you've just sautéed broccoli or you've, saw, or you've made some rice or you've made uh, a pot of beans, freezable. Um, those are the general rules of thumb that you can just use as a, as a simple heuristic. Um, so yeah, so so the the recipes that I've focused on are really to help you uh, maintain consistency. Consistency is is the key thing that I just wish everyone would would recognize, um, because there are a lot of companies, particularly in the U.S., where they are offering you um, a, a layer of a, a sort of simple guide to how you can optimize your diets, the correct ingredients you should be eating, um, the foods that don't spike your glucose level as much, um, doing a genomic test to figure out exactly what food you should and should not be eating. I guarantee you 80 to 90% of what people are recommended is probably going to be the same. I really don't think it's that different when it comes to whole unprocessed foods. So if you uh, you know, are suggested to, to not have a particular brand of crisps or a particular <clears throat> a food like ice cream or a high fat, high sugar uh, product, guess what? Most people aren't going to be recommended that either. And most people are going to have a negative reaction to it. So always think about it through the perspective of what is the main thing I should be? What is the elephant in the room? that is true for everyone it's consistency it's unprocessing your diet removing the crap that most people recognize as crap and increasing the the uh, healthy whole food ingredients that most people will know is good for them um, that's where the <clears throat> and it really comes down to consistency that is the one thing that i want people to take away from it the other thing that i would say is diversity so um, you've probably already heard by now there's plenty of research and lots of PR around getting as much diversity in your diet as possible and that's very true um, the more di the, the analogy that I always use when whenever I'm talking about um, the gut microbiota it's as if you've got some bored kids in your gut 
and uh, if you give them the same food over and over again, they're gonna get they're gonna get bored. They're gonna get cranky. They're not gonna like it. If you give them a diverse smorgasbord of all these different ingredients, they're gonna have a party. They're gonna absolutely love it. They're gonna be feeding on lots of different interesting new substrate or foods, such that they flourish and that they populate uh, your your gut and do the best work for you of metabolizing your food, of producing uh, other neurochemicals and other uh, chemicals in, in general. It's like, a, it's like a pharmacy down in your, in your gut and actually having a better relationship with your skin, with your brain, because there are different axes that communicate directly and indirectly uh, to your gut microbiota as well. So diversity is absolutely king. And that's why whenever you look at one of my recipes, you, you'll notice there's plenty of spice, there are plenty of different ingredients that I always uh, use. There are interesting ways of preparing them and trying to do the best in terms of not overcooking things, lightly steaming, uh, and also pr the process of how you layer flavors uh, into your food is super important as well, which is why you'll see like pops of herb or pops of color at the end of a meal or me stirring in spinach right at the end so it gently steams in the residual heat of the pan or the casserole or whatever I'm cooking. So that those are different elements that you'll find. It's hopefully simple enough such that you can maintain consistency and it's also going to be full of uh, diverse ingredients, not necessarily exotic ingredients, things that you can find in your local supermarket or your local market, but certainly uh, ingredients that are combined in a way that maintains diversity for the benefit of your gut microbiota. The other thing is whole food. So um, whole food that's minimally processed, we're removing away from white refined bread, for example, to things like sourdough, things like rye, things like uh, breads that you could use as a weapon because it's so it's so dense and, and heavy like a, a German uh, uh, rye bread is like a perfect example of something that's really really rich in fiber um, and then you, you do have sort of um, people who fare less well with bread just because of, of the fact that they might have celiac or uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity um, but also people who just can't deal with their sugar spikes and and I view bread as a as a uh, a luxury staple for me i know personally i've tried a plenty of different breads gluten-free varieties rye varieties and i use it as something uh, that i enjoy a couple of times a week but perhaps not every single day um the the staples in my diet are things like beans legumes uh, plenty of cruciferous vegetables greens that's exactly where i want to be focusing a lot of my uh, ingredients when it when it comes to what I want to be introducing into my into my gut that will ultimately serve my health as well. So the 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 whole foods is is certainly something that I think people should also think about, and hopefully you'll find lots of interesting ideas of how to combine whole foods into delicious recipes. Hopefully you can see how I'm layering different foods onto each other, whether that's in a, a curry or a stew or a tray bake. The the strategy is fairly similar. Um, and there's lots of substitutions as well. And I've actually put substitutions in the, in the book as well. Um, so those are, I mean, just to, just to summarize those, those things, consistency is the main, main takeaway. Diversity of foods, whole foods. I'm often asked, partic I mean, this, this happens quite a lot because I'm doing the, the PR for the, the book at the moment from um, you know, anyone from a broadsheet to a tabloid, to uh, a, a website and newsletter, they ask really, really similar questions. And unfortunately, it perpetuates a particular idea that I think is pretty rampant um, because we all have this desire to have a quick fix. And that is what ingredient is best for X. And, you know, if I was trying to be uh quick and clever about it you know i could say uh, pumpkin seeds are good for this because it's got vitamin e and magnesium and all the rest of it uh or you know butter, butternut squash is great for skin because you know it has carotenoids and um a whole collection of uh vitamins that we know are critical for collagen building and, and, and all the rest of it and whilst all that is true 
the main thing that people need to focus on is the collection of all the different ingredients that coalesce and work synergistically to improve your body's innate ability to maintain skin, maintain your uh, brain health, maintain cardiovascular health, maintain metabolic health. It's really about focusing on getting a huge collection of all those different whole food ingredients rather than the individual ingredients themselves and ensuring that you have those individual elements in your diet. I love talking about the different uh, compounds and bioactives that you find in things like cruciferous vegetables and kale. And I love talking about things like sulforaphane and, and the evidence around how if you you know use sulforaphane in an experimental environment, you give it to uh, lab rats, for example, it, their, their measures of inflammation go down and then you, you put that in a human trial and then you know what uh, it reduces the um, impact of environmental exposure and it actually increases the excretion of particular toxic compounds in in, in our environment these there are studies that have done this with broccoli sprout extract we're talking about that on a on a future podcast and we talked about it on a previous podcast as well i love all that kind of stuff it's great it's really really uh, interesting for me and i think it's going to be interesting for listeners as well however it 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 does pose a bit of a issue at the same time because i think it perpetuates this idea of singular ingredients as the key to improving one's health and longevity um, and really it comes down to the the diversity and the consistency of your diet and i'm going to sound like a broken record here because i'm just going to say consistency consistently and consistently say consistency because it's that important it's really about getting a diverse collection of all these wonderful ingredients that have these wonderful impacts because if i guarantee if you're just going to eat broccoli your entire life it's not going to be healthy because you're going to be lacking in certain other elements as well things like proteins things like uh, the fibers that you find in different pulses etc um, so you really got to think about whilst that's super interesting great you know sunflower seeds and uh, hazelnuts are great for vitamin E magnesium and zinc and that might be good for things like inflammatory um, uh, skin disorders uh, or, or uh, clear skin it really comes down to the overall picture of your diet, the food matrix, and the way in which all these different ingredients combine with each other. And all this is to say, you know, the reason why this book is shorter in the introduction section, I go through some really key concepts, basically the ones that I'm going through with you right now, and focusing on the food and the food that has been designed and um, tested in a way to ensure maximum diversity, ease, flavorful cooking, that is also super healthy because of all the reasons that we're discussing here. That's why you know my focus is really trying to help you become consistently a better cook, a more confident cook, um, because that's going to have the the biggest bang for your book. Not just you know another book about. Um, why different foods are super interesting because nutrition science hasn't changed a massive amount over the last few decades we all know what we should be eating but it's the implementation that's the that's the bit that's hard um on the subject of gut health uh i think uh, because it's a, a really important topic it's a very popular topic as well uh i did um do a short uh chapter on gut health and, and basically how everything starts in the gut um, and the three or four things that you need to focus on when it comes to gut health all the things that i've listed above but largely plants so there is some pretty convincing evidence i would say that a largely uh, plant focused diet so one that is 80 to 90 percent plants uh, is universally beneficial for your gut and i think even those in this sort of carnivore community, the low-carb community, uh, paleo community, I, I mean, I, it's interesting to call them communities. I, I guess, you know, they're online communities or whatever. Even those pretty hard liners are coming around to this idea of introducing more plants into the diet. And actually, if you listen to my TED talk, I can't, when you analyze most of these diets, they are pretty plant focused. They remove the crap, they introduce a lot more plants. Some of them have meat, some of them don't, but in large, they, they do have very similar qualities, which is why if you can 
maintain that particular diet without you know, shifting and, and you know, being tempted by excess sugar and overeating and, and all these other things, then you know, it's, no, it's no wonder people have pretty, pretty um, uh, profound outcomes on them um, if they enjoy it and they're consistent with it. So largely plants, I think, is a good heuristic um, for most people to have prebiotics the the unsexy cousin of probiotics so prebiotics are um, fibrous foods that have unique fibers that um, uh, will in particular uh, that, that are particularly good at improving your uh, population of gut microbes so it will improve their ability to thrive it will improve the diversity of the microbes that you have in your gut um, they are uniquely positioned to do that. And these prebiotics are not really, really expensive. And perhaps that's why they don't get as much a- attention. So it's things like inulin that you'll find in chicory. Um, it will be garlic, uh, asparagus, artichoke, Jerusalem artichoke. You know, f- fantastic, easy, accessible ingredients that we can try and get into our, into our diet as much as possible. If you do have a particular issue with increasing fiber, particularly if you're going from a low fiber diet to a high fiber diet, you might find some symptoms of uh, bloating and uncomfortable abdominal aches and pains. We're going to be talking about that actually uh, with Dr. B, who's a gastroenterologist, who's written a fantastic book himself actually um, about uh, increasing fiber um, and the potential pitfalls of increasing fiber if you're not used to uh, having these kind of ingredients in your diet so i always recommend people go slow um, and just ramp it up um, in in increments over weeks rather than all of a sudden having a really high fiber meal so just something to to bear in mind Um, probiotics are absolutely fantastic as well kimchi sauerkraut uh, all the different sort of fermented foods that you can find like kefirs and uh, kombucha um, there are some studies showing that fermented foods are particularly good at improving your gut microbiota even some that demonstrate more so than high fiber foods themselves uh, i would wait to see whether this is replicable in other studies uh, I'm, I'm only aware of a, of a handful um, because nutrition studies are uniquely pretty hard to, to do and very expensive and there's not much funding for it um, but I, I would say, you know, if you can get probiotic foods into your diet, um, whether that's making the probiotic food yourself, sauerkraut, kimchi, cheese, all that kind of stuff, it's very easy to do. Uh, you can look up online, there's, there's tons of recipes, um, then do. And I, I, as an example, let's say I'm having uh, a breakfast. I do this very often. I'll have leftovers and I'll warm it up and then I'll put some sauerkraut on the side of that um, with uh, maybe a little bit of aged cheese and maybe a handful of nuts as well. Like my breakfast is so, so simple. Um, the ones in, in the book are like recipes, but when I when it comes to consistency, I'm really thinking about all those different hacks to maintain the quality of my overall diet. And so that can be a handful of nuts, a little bit of uh, aged cheese uh, or marinated tofu. I I do mix it up all the time. Um, And having some sauerkraut or uh, kimchi on the side as well. Really, really easy additions. And again, like leaning on my my TED talk, if you're just thinking just one more, can I get just one more portion of fruit, vegetable, nuts or seeds into my diet every mealtime, you're well on your way to having a diverse, consistently whole unprocessed diet um, that will will put you in, in incredible steer when it comes to preventing the likelihood of all these lifestyle related illnesses that we're at risk of because we live in a, in a highly processed um, poor food environment. Well, a lot of us do anyway. Um, and the other thing is polyphenol. So I've said for gut health, it's largely plants, prebiotics, additional probiotics and polyphenols. That is basically another fancy way of saying getting as many colorful ingredients into your diet. Fruits, vegetables, absolutely fantastic. Get the rainbow. And I know it's cliche to say get the rainbow in, but those different colors represent all the thousands of different polyphenols that you'll find in colored fruits and vegetables. And color is a really good heuristic as well. It's a nice rule of thumb. So uh, going for a radicchio, which has dark red 
a, a, a real deep color, uh, the pigment, that's indicative and the, and the bitter taste of it, those are indicative of the collection of different polyphenols that you'll find in a radicchio or a kale, for example, or cavolo nero. Again, it's got a real deep, uh, bitter color, a bitter flavor, and a deep, earthy green color to it as well. And that is a concentration of all those different polyphenols. There is some, you know, stuff online about how uh, all plants are out to get us. You know, there's a, a, a bunch of popular books about. Uh, lectins and anti-nutrients. I think anti-nutrients is a is a bit of um, a scary term to use, um, and I always use the example of turmeric. So, when you look at um, these polyphenols um, at, at at a cellular level, what they do is actually elicit an inflammation response. So they actually, uh, to put it in a in a sort of broad term, they attack your own cells. And what that does is it generates a response that is net anti-inflammatory. So uh, it's the antioxidant re reactive uh, re response, basically. So what it does is it encourages your cells to react in a way that generates an anti-inflammatory uh, response. And so the net impact is uh, anti-inflammatory. The, the, the parallel to this is exercise. So if, you, if someone was to say, Okay, when you do exercise, what happens is your blood pressure goes up, sugar gets dumped into your bloodstream, and uh, you have uh, a net inflammatory effect because of all the shearing that you do to your muscles. If you look at it just through that very small lens, you would determine that exercise is uniquely bad for you, and you should never, never do any exercise. But if you look at a, at a long enough uh, period of time, you'll realize that regular exercise, even though it has those short-term potential uh, uh, downsides, over time, what it does is it encourages resilience. It encourages your body to become more resilient to any other stresses. And so the net effect is anti-inflammatory. The net effect is anti-cancer. The net effect is pro-cardiovascular health. So just, just be aware of how it's very easy to use specific small insights to um, argue a particular point of view that actually might be counter to what might, might be helpful. So that's my little tidbit about, you know, reading too much into individual ingredients and how they might be harmful. If you feel well, if you're unprocessing your diet, you've got lots of whole foods, you ain't gonna worry. It's really down to consistency. Um, one other thing before I move on from, from the book, I wanna, I, I do want to talk about the flavorful aspect. So, you know, I've talked about healthy, talked about easy. Flavor and the perception of flavor is very, very important. I'm going to read uh, a section from, from the book. I've never done a reading from my book before. I mean, m most of my books are like, you know, recipes. I don't think anyone would like me reading out recipes. Um, but uh, I do want to talk a bit about um, the the flavor experience and the tasting experience. So um, part of my job as a doctor is to show you what to eat, but as a home cook, it's also to ensure that you enjoy both the cooking and tasting experience. This might be a bit of an esoteric way of looking at food and it might seem contrived. However, there is some science behind it. So sensory information about food is coming from all the receptors in your body, your nose, your mouth, your ears. You know, when you go into a restaurant, sorry, I'm, I'm reading off the page now. When you go into a restaurant, the anticipation of getting that food, you know, you might have seen some things on Instagram about what the dishes are, you know, you've got the smells, you've got the, the wonderful waiter, all these conjure to give you the ultimate experience that you have whenever you go into a hospitality. So I'll go back to the, the book now. Um, all these different uh, uh, receptors measuring this uh, sensory information gets processed in the primary sensory cortices of the brain. If you eat a subjectively delicious tasting meal, these stimuli coalesce to create a positive experience that rewards your behavior and encourages repetition. We get the opportunity to have these rewarding experiences two, three times a day, which over time creates habit. Now, to create it, uh, I'm adding some, some you know, um, hyperbole here, so excuse me. Um, to create a healthy eating habit, 
whereby the choice of foods that serve the function of your body becomes subjectively desirable and automatic. We must strive to make this a positive experience sensorily and physically. This is to say we can't rely on willpower alone. This is going back to what I was saying about uh, the implementation element being very hard. To, sorry, I'm, I'm going to read again. This is to say we can't rely on willpower alone to eat, to want to eat green vegetables, legumes and fruit just because we know they're good for us. The consumption of these foods has to be a pleasurable experience, which is why my recipes intertwine flavor and function. And then I go into talk a bit about pleasure research and, um, you know, the, the mindset around eating foods, which is something that I think is quite overlooked. Um, and the anticipation and how we describe healthy foods to us. So a lot of effort that I went to when I when I um, wrote the book was actually um, talking and thinking about the descriptions of the uh, of the recipes. It was talking about you know the, the putting effort into like how do I make this sound and how do I make the descriptors sound super delicious such that you just really want to dive into this this meal it's another reason as to why i was really adamant to make sure that this book um had photographs for every single recipe because what is the main driver you know me as a massive cookbook fan what is the main driver for me wanting to cook a particular recipe it's the image it's the photo it's what it looks like it's the the shine on the on the food it's the you know how uh, the spoon is placed you know the styling of it I know these all sound very contrived, but as like a food lover that I am, all these different elements are really, really important when it comes to making healthy eating a pleasurable experience that encourages repetition. And the repetition element of it, the the sort of the the the, the need to have that pleasurable experience, I think is, you know, something that I think will create a habit. I, I didn't talk about this in the book, but part of how I made healthy eating a pleasurable and habitual experience for me when I got ill uh, over 13 years ago now, um, oh, 14 years ago now, um, was by making healthy food pleasurable. And so the use of spice, the use of, uh, of, of playful elements, you know, garnishes, textures, all those things are really, really important because you know, I didn't want to just eat spinach, brown rice, you know, some boiled chicken, maybe a couple other vegetables like a lot of people do, particularly those on meal plans, you know, it's got to be something that you, you absolutely love. Um, and that will encourage repetition. So hopefully, you know, that's my little sell for Dr. Rupi Cooks that you can buy you know, in any, any um, uh, bookstore. But even if you don't, you know, hopefully what I've said in, in this bit of the podcast will encourage you to really think about, okay, how I'm going to unprocess my diet, how I'm going to make sure that I'm going to make healthy eating, whole food, habitual, and also thinking about all those different elements of, my, of your gut health, largely plants, polyphenols, and um, prebiotics. Um, uh, you, you know, the, you can't really go wrong when you're just focusing it around those things. Um, and, you know, I, I would not say ignore i think particularly when it comes to investigations like continuous glucose monitors um dna tests microbiota tests uh, at home blood tests i think they can be motivators for the first bit of of uh, improving one's diet or giving some insights into how damaging certain elements of your diet might be uh you know, it, it's un unlikely to be whole unprocessed food that's going to be damaging to your diet. It's most likely going to be all the other elements that you can probably recognize are going to be unhealthy. So I think those are good motivating factors. They don't dial into the consistency. And that is the, the dirty little secret that I was talking about earlier. The consistency part, that's something that we really need to dial down on. And, you know, it kind of lends itself as to why I started my app because my aspiration for the app is to using smart technology, things like machine learning and AI, to enable you to plug in your tastes, your preferences, to learn from your choices as to what you love eating. Click a button, it creates your meal plan for the week. It can be for your partner, your kids, it could be for anyone that you want. It already recognizes what their dislikes and likes are. 
in a click of a button, all your meals are generated in terms of your, your meal plan for that week. You can remove the de- the days that you don't want or the meals that you don't need. You can also add filters, things like, you know, price. Um, I don't want to spend X, more than X amount every week or I want my particular ingredients to be ethically sourced. I want them to be organic. I want them to be as organic as possible given my budget. Um, And then you click another button and you have your shopping list and then you can either take that to the market or you can go to um, uh, your online grocer. That's the simplest flow of how shopping should be. Uh, Right now, it's really, really hard. Uh, I have been chatting to a few uh, users of the app. I've been chatting to a few people who who absolutely love uh, recipes and cooking, but they fall down at certain areas because of the food environment that we unfortunately uh, have to contend with both online and offline and so you know that that's sort of the direction of travel that i'm going in um, with, with the app we're also going to be doing some other more educational features uh, with the app as well so i might as well talk about the app on this part of the pod um, as part of your subscription for those of you who have got an annual subscription or monthly subscription i want to be doing regular Q&A events and regular live cooking events where I can sort of help you in a, in a bit more of a one-to-one basis. Um, I know Android users, I know you, you're waiting for an Android. Trust me, it's really, really hard and costly to create technology um, in general. Like putting out an app on an app store is is really expensive and very, very uh, complicated, particularly when you don't have your own uh, tech team so it's it's it is really hard it really comes down to me I'm literally the one jumping in on customer service emails uh, responding to comments uh, making sure that the app works properly ensuring the quality assurance of the app you know removing any uh, bugs or flagging them it's tough uh, but that being said we are working on it and hopefully uh, soon we'll have an Android version and everything will be fine and dandy um, but yes, for existing app subscribers, we're going to be looking at trying to give as much value as possible from a subscription to the app. So this will include things like um, cooking, live cooking sessions, live Q&As with me. The best way to find out about that will be if you are a subscriber to the app newsletter and you can find that on the app itself. You just uh, go to profile and then toggle uh, subscribing to the app newsletter. I'll also shout about it in the regular newsletter as well, just so no one's missed or anything like that. Um, and yeah, really excited about that. And the reason why we're going to be able to do more of uh, that stuff is because um, I'm going to be investing in uh, a studio. So the studio is going to be an amazing space where we are going to build a fit for purpose kitchen we're just building a kitchen from scratch in this in this space it's going to be all kitchen doctor's kitchen branded um we're going to have uh some podcasts there some uh uh, like cooking shows um we're also going to be doing um a, a lot of socials and all that kind of stuff from this space um it's going to be big enough such that we can do intimate supper club events i also want to do live podcasting there as well i think that'd be fantastic um, to invite you know people to come to come to the studio uh, and have that sort of in real life connection, um, and uh, it's going to be like a place that we are just going to be we're going to be like a Willy Wonka's for healthy cooking and recipes that make it easy uh, for you to eat well every day. Um, so I'm going to be looking for a food producer, someone who really understands flavor who understands the challenges of, uh, of of cooking midweek meals, meals for families, meals for fussy eaters, meals for health needs. Um, you know, the nutrition sort of arm is going to come from from me and the research team, but we're going to be doing a lot more of uh, of that stuff um, of, of there. So yeah, having a food producer, having... Um, a, uh, a dedicated space, I think, is going to be a real unlock for creativity for the Doctor's Kitchen. So I'm super excited about that. And we're also going to be doing another newsletter. It's going to be called Seasonal Sundays. Every Sunday, we're going to do a deep dive into a particular ingredient. It's going to be starting in uh, February. So if you're a regular newsletter subscriber, 
uh, that you can find on the doctorskitchen.com forward slash newsletter. You'll be able to find the, uh, we're going to shout about it in that newsletter as well, so you won't miss it. But I'm really excited about that because we're going to do deep dives into what I love talking about, which are the mechanisms, the, 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 just how, how, uh, uh, varied our ingredients are, um, and how wonderful they are. Uh, and giving you ideas about how you can eat seasonally as well uh, on a budget too. So there'll be that, and we're going to be doing a lot more uh, stuff in the studio around seasonal Sundays, different ingredients, and obviously recipes as well. So that's all the sort of app and studio stuff. Talked about the book. What I'm focusing on in 23 um, is it comes down to this idea of uh, mimesis. So um, just just to j- just to explain mimetic theory in in very simple terms it's the idea that we learn and want things because we see others wanting and having them um it's easy there's a saying i think from Rene girard who is sort of the the founder of of this of this um uh, philosophy or way of thinking it's easier to to desire things once they have been first desired by someone else and it's accelerated that wanting that desire is accelerated the closer that person is to your circle so the closer you are to someone um, that has desired something you're more likely to desire that i'll give you a very simple example so let's say your best friend turns up to your house or flat or whatever and they've got a brand new car and you know you might be happy for them you might be you know really uh uh encouraging and oh, it's good for you good for you but then all of a sudden it implants in your head this idea that maybe i want a car maybe i want a sports car why don't i get a car or maybe it's another example where someone goes on holiday and they're one of your friends and then you see them having a great time and they're frolicking in the sea and then if you're being really honest with yourself and you're being really vulnerable just with yourself you will probably unveil the 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 slight envy the the hint of jealousy and the overwhelming desire to want to have the same thing to to want to have the same experience this is mimetic theory my, the theory of mimesis in a in a nutshell and i think as someone who spends a lot of time uh on on social media um on you know, platforms that essentially uh, will, will uh, publish the successes of other people, it's very easy to fall into the same trap. No matter where you are in life, you know, whether you work from home, whether you're a full-time carer, whether you have a high-flying job in the city, whether you are an entrepreneur with tens of millions in the bank, it does not matter. We are all vulnerable to the power of mimesis. If if anyone hasn't come across Rene Girard and um, the the theory of mimesis, I highly encourage you to 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 look it up. It was I I featured it on one of my newsletters I think this year um, with a little video explaining how Rene Girard came up with this theory. He basically recognised in some of the best stories and the most well-renowned uh, novels that there was always this repeating theme of the protagonist having been inspired uh, by the successes or the wants f- of someone else, whether it might have been a mentor, maybe it was someone who um, uh, who uh, was before their time. They've always been inspired by someone else to want the same thing. And it's just it's just very funny because... It can be a good thing and a bad thing. It, it's a good thing because, you know, mimesis exists, particularly with, you could use the example of babies. Babies mimic, they mimic their older siblings, they mimic their parents. It's a way of accelerating learning. It's a way of learning the rules of life and, and getting to grips with the ropes of what is a good thing to have and what is a bad thing to have. Um, it's also a bad thing because it leads to envy, it leads to wanting the wrong things, it leads to inappropriate desires, and it leads you further away from your truth. It leads you further away from actually what can actually fulfill you. And actually being aware of my mises, being aware of the pull of desires that are conjured by other people and focusing 
on actually what truly makes you happy. You have to scratch away at the at the sort of the foil and the and the surface and and the the crust of of uh, of of where that truly lies. That's how you get a lot more fulfillment. And so one thing that I was was given actually by my my wife um she 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 gave me a, a picture of a of a quote and it just says own six words own lane own pace own race own lane own pace own race and i think this is particularly useful for me because i i see the successes of of other people uh, of of um, my colleagues of you know and it's very easy to be pulled into lots of different directions and you might be having the same pulls as well. So whether or not this is this is relevant for you or not, I think it's a good saying to constantly keep uh, aware of. Or it's, a, it's a good philosophy. It's a good sort of um, framework to, to constantly be reminded of. The, the pulls of, of mimesis, and you'll find it everywhere. You'll absolutely find it everywhere in your friendship circles, in your professional circles, in your online circles, uh, when you're browsing online, the pull of mimesis is everywhere. And since I've learned ab about mimetic theory and since I've become a lot more aware of it, I see it everywhere. I see it everywhere. I see it in my friends. I see it in my family. I see it uh, in my my most cherished friends, my most loved ones. Um, uh, and it's you know it's not a bad thing it's not a it's not a good thing it it just is it just is and it's i think it's something that we just have to accept um so that's what i'm focusing on in 2023 the pull of mimesis and being more intent and purposeful about what i allow myself to dive uh, into and uh, what will actually lead to a lot more fulfillment which is my studio my uh, creating my own cooking show um i i've tried for years to you know create my own weekly healthy cooking show something that goes out on tv something that you know rivals some of the biggest cooking shows that is all geared towards health and geared towards everything that i talk about in dr ruby cooks um and you know what i'm just going to do it myself so you know that's the reason for the studio that's why we're going to be doing doctor's kitchen uh cooking on on youtube um, I just want to dive into into that. So if you if you are watching this on YouTube, please do subscribe. Or you know if you're listening to this in the podcast, an easy way to support would be to subscribe to the newsletter to the <laughs> newsletter and and YouTube. Um, and hopefully the app is going to be uh, a, a huge unlock for a lot of people looking to improve their health in 2023 and beyond as well. Because I I'm truly truly committed to making this the best app possible. Um, to making it continually better, to investing in more health goals. Uh, women's health and menopause are going to be high in the priority uh, for Q1 uh, this year and uh, a lot more features as well that we are. Uh, I'm constantly looking through everyone's comments and we're going to be doing a lot more deep dive sessions as well with app subscribers. So definitely looking out for that as well. So I really hope you enjoyed today's ramble. Um, I'm going to try and do rambles like this, but a lot more focused and a lot more structured and deep dives into particular areas that I'm really interested in. Um, I want to take feedback from from you guys about how I can improve the pods as well. We've got an incredible lineup of um, people that I'm interviewing. Next week we have Tim Spector, we'll have uh, Dr. B, um, we'll have um, Dr. Amy uh, Gadjar. We have a, a ton of people that I want to interview as well on the subject of nutrition, but also looking a little bit wider on the subjects of philosophy, fulfillment, what actually makes us happy and frameworks that you can use as well to improve uh, your, your self-belief and um, ultimately how you can coast through life and be unaffected uh, by, by the, the steals of, of pleasure. Um, which are uh, surrounding us and, and to become impervious to that. That's sort of like what I'd, I'd love for this podcast to, to also lean into. It's, it's that, um, that element of, uh, of well-being. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your attention and uh, I look forward to chatting like this again with you. Thanks a lot.